Well, a very warm welcome to be with us around the Lord's table this morning. We're going to commence our service together, first of all, with a song, and then if you would bow your heads, we'll open with a word of prayer. So here's our opening song. Loving Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace to give you the honour and the glory that is due to your great and holy name. To thank you, loving Father, for your amazing promises. To thank you, loving Father, for the wonderful hope that we have of the soon return of your Son, of the establishment of your kingdom that we pray will come soon, loving Father. And while we wait for that time, loving Father, we, we pray that you'll be with us, that you'll bless us, that you'll comfort us, have compassion upon us, as we come around the memorials of your son to remember his life and his death and his resurrection we we pray loving father that you'll especially be with those that are that are suffering from sickness and disease that you'll put your loving caring and healing arms around them be with all those loving father that that need your comfort those that loving father that are that are suffering from poverty and, and unemployment from sadness and from loneliness we, we pray, loving Father, that you'll help each and every one of us according to our needs and that this fellowship that we share this day might help us and strengthen us to walk faithfully before you until the appearing of your Son. So bless us, loving Father, and be with us and accept of our thanks and all of our praises to you through your Son, even our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The parable of the prodigal son is one of the most remarkable and incredible and probably the most well-known parables of all of Jesus' stories. A famous writer in the 1800s once wrote that this parable was the greatest story ever written and his name was Charles Dickens. It's a, it's a simple and deep parable or story all rolled into one. It contains remarkable, intriguing themes and lessons and concepts at every turn. It's, it's, a, it's a story, it's a parable that we really need to read very, very carefully and, 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 and almost take it word by word. And We don't have time to do that this morning. But what we do need to understand and recognise is this is Jesus speaking to us. The words of Jesus. And Jesus has a message. And, and, and in this story, we have all these layers of, of, of a childlike story and, and then a spiritual lesson and then a depth of concepts in relation to our relationship with our God. And so we know this story well. We know that this is the story of a, of a young man, a young son, who wants to take his inheritance and he wants to go to a far country. And, and the characters in this story 
made up of the father who represents God. And then we have the, the, the two sons. And, and what we find is that this younger son, he takes his inheritance and he goes and he wastes it in a far country. What, what this son wanted to do is he wanted to get out of the control and the influence of his father. So this is a rebellious son. This is somebody who wants to get away from the house of God, away from the influence of God. And he wants to move away. And, and we're all guilty of that at times. So we need to see ourselves in this parable. That there are all times when we want to get away from God because we want to live a lifestyle that suits us. There are things and aspects about our life that, that we, we don't want God to see. And so this, this young man, he takes his money and he goes. He takes the family inheritance and he goes and he wastes it. And we know that he ends up with no friends and no money and he has to get a job. And he gets a job working on a pig farm. He's a Jew. He's a Jew working in a pig farm with these unclean animals. And, and, and what the record says is in, in Luke chapter 15 and in verses 16 to 17, it says these words. It says concerning the young man, it says, He would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. So the story goes that this son is now working with the pigs and he's so hungry and he's got no friends and no one's helping him, no one's feeding him and he's so hungry. He's now looking at the pig food and going, even that's now attractive to me. And so he's now hit rock bottom. And it says that when he comes to himself, when he thinks about things, he thinks about the way things were back at his father's house, back at the house of God, back with God. And he thinks to himself, you know what? Even my father has servants that have more than enough food. In fact, they have food to spare. And here I am. I'm hungry. I know what I'll do. I'll go back to my father's house. I'll go back to my father and I'll tell him that I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you, that I'm no longer worthy to be your son and I'll become a hired servant. Give me a job. And that's his plan. It's a three point plan. And what we want to understand is when we read this message and we read this parable carefully, we can assume that the son has now hit rock bottom and he's now repenting. He's now sorry for the circumstance he's in. He's sorry for the mess he's got into. He's sorry for what he's done. And now he wants to go back to his dad as a humbled man and bury his head and say he's sorry to his dad and, and tell him he's not worthy and I'll just become a servant. And, and that's how we often interpret this parable. But but that's not what the parable's saying. That's not what it's saying. He's saying, I'm hungry. None of my friends, none of my new friends are helping me. I've hit rock bottom. I'm in a pig farm and I'm still hungry. And if I go home, I can get a job and work as a servant and have food to eat and not be hungry. This comment about him coming to himself and coming to his senses is not about repentance. This young man is not repenting. He's hungry. And what he wants to do is he wants to go somewhere where he can get fed. And he thinks about things and he goes, you know what? The servants are well fed at my father's house. I'll go back there and I'll work for my salvation. This is a Jew who is thinking Judaistic ways and Judaistic thoughts and thinking the only way out of this mess I've got myself into is to work my way out of it. And I reckon the best place for me to work my way out of it is with my father's house because the servants there, they get looked after with plenty of food. So I'll go there and do that. And that's his plan. What he totally misunderstood and hadn't come to terms with was what his father was all about. 
And that's about to be revealed to him in the most spectacular way. Because what he does is it says in verse 20 that he goes to his father. It says he arose and he came to his father. And when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion upon him, and he ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And, and again, there's a really important point here that we need to understand. You know, right throughout the, the, the word of God, right throughout the Bible record, God is calling us to be his sons and his daughters. He calls us in, in, in Galatians, in, in, in chapter 3, he says that we are the sons of God, we are the daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as were baptised into Christ have put on Christ. So we come into the family when we respond to God's calling, when we respond to Jesus saying, come and follow me, when we respond to that and we are baptised into Christ, we put on Christ, we become a part of God's family. When we come out of that water, we are born again into God's family. And God says, I love you, I love you, I love you. But don't expect God to go and chase you if you decide to leave him. Because this parable is all about that aspect. He's telling us that this son who asked for his inheritance and wanted to leave, God didn't stop him. God didn't chase him. God didn't went looking for him. The father, seen in God, didn't go and look for this child. Just like when Adam and Eve, in the very beginning, God says, I give you a choice. If you obey me, you'll live. If you disobey me, you'll die. It's your choice, freedom of choice. And this son exercised his freedom of choice, as we often do when we behave inappropriately, when we behave badly, when we, like this son, are stupid, and we, don't, we go and do stupid things. And this boy, he goes and he's wasted all the inheritance, and now he's hungry and he wants to go back and so what we need to understand is that that god won't chase us but he will keep looking for us it's like he goes to the front gate every day and he looks for his son and he's been looking 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 many days for his son and then all of a sudden he sees him and the record says that when he saw him he had compassion that's our father he had compassion and he ran to him and he fell on his neck and he kissed him. The son didn't have a chance to say anything. The father showed his great love because what the father is all about, what our father is all about, what this boy's father is all about is about a relationship. It's not about the money. And it's not even about the disappointment that the son showed to his father at times. The father wants a relationship with him and with us. And it's a relationship not based on works, but based on grace. Because what the father does here, it's remarkable. First of all, the son, having been embraced by his father, says to his father, Dad, I've sinned against God and I've sinned against you. It's exactly what he, he said, point one of plan, plan one. Plan two, point two, was that I'm no longer worthy to be your son. But the son now no longer puts point three in. He doesn't put point three in, which was, I'll work for my salvation. Because he's now seen demonstrated for him once and for all the amazing love and compassion and grace of his father. Because what does his father do? His father calls to the servants who have also ran down and he says, give him the best robe, give him the ring and give him the sandals and the shoes. And, and, and what did they represent? Well, the best robe was going to cover him. Remember, he's just come from the, from the pig pen. He's covered in, in, in pig food and mud and dirt and slops. He's filthy. He's a disgrace. But the father says, cover him. Cover him with the best robe. He's going to be covered with his father's righteousness. And the ring means that he's going to, be, he's going to have his authority restored to him. 
Remember how, how, how the ring that was given to Haman allowed Haman to make the decree. The, the ring was the seal of approval. He would take that ring and he, he'd put it into the wax and that would, be the, that, that would mean things could not be changed because the stamp of approval, the signet ring of approval. And so the father gives him the ring of authority within the family. And the sandals, well, in those days, the sandals represented that you were not a servant. Servants never wore shoes, never wore sandals. The shoes were, 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 were for the, 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 the people of the house, but not for the servants. And by, by putting the shoes on, the father has almost anticipated what the son might have been going to say, but he's seen this extraordinary outpouring of love, and grace and we come to the table of the Lord this morning and we see on this table the love and the mercy and the grace of our God see what our father wants us to do is he wants us to come to him knowing that we are flawed beings knowing that we are imperfect you know what he doesn't expect from us is he doesn't expect us to basically come to him already holy. He doesn't want us to basically say, look, I've made these terrible mistakes. Let me sort my life out. Let me do these works, these good works, these kind works. Let me do those things first and, and make myself holy before you and then I'll come to you that's that's Judaistic thoughts that's how Judaism works that's not how grace works only God can make us holy only God can make us righteous and he does that through his gift of grace as he's showing to his son in this parable as he shows us through this shed blood Holiness is not what God wants from us. I'll say that again. Holiness is not what God wants from us. Holiness is what God wants for us. It's not our holiness God is looking for. It's his holiness that he wants to give us as a gift. The prodigal son... He finally got it, and he now gives up the concept of working for his salvation. He parks that, and he doesn't go there. His work is now a labour of love. And that's what our work needs to be. And that's what our lives need to be in these last days. A labour of love for an ever appreciation for what our Father has done for us. And so may it be that as we partake of this bread and, and drink of this wine, that we might reflect on the grace of God who throws his arms around us, who falls upon us, who kisses us, who shows compassion to us because he loves us. He wants a relationship. He wants us to love him with all of our hearts, all of our soul, all of our strength and all of our mind. Amen. We read in Mark chapter 14 and verse 22 these words. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So before we partake of the bread, let us offer a word of thanks. Loving Heavenly Father, once again we come before you to continue our praise, to tell you, loving God, that we love you. We love you and we, we so greatly appreciate all your love, your blessings, your compassion, your mercy 
and your grace. And especially at this time, loving Father, as we prepare to partake, firstly of the bread and, and then shortly of the, of the cup. And we see in this bread your son's life, a life dedicated and committed to you, but a life of love, a life committed to doing your will. And so we pray, loving Father, that as we partake of this bread, that, that we might look to his example and, and strive to be more like him in these, in these days that remain to us. And so we ask you to bless this bread. We offer our thanks and our praises for all these blessings. Through Jesus Christ's name, amen. And so it's recorded that Jesus took the bread and he broke it and blessed it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And it's recorded that Jesus took the cup when he had given thanks. He gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of your sins. Verily I say unto you, I'll drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Let us offer a word of thanks. Gracious, merciful, loving heavenly father again we come to you to continue our praise to continue worshiping you loving god to acknowledging you as our great and mighty god and our loving heavenly father and as we come now to partake of this cup of this wine the symbol of your son's shed blood we plead to you loving father to have mercy upon us to forgive us to wash us clean, to remember our sins no more. We pray, loving Father, for your love and for your grace. And we do so through your Son, your only begotten Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks uh, very much for being with us once again. Uh, hope and pray and trust that you're enjoying this little mini series of parables that we've been looking at over the, the past few weeks. Important for us to remember that these are lessons that our Lord Jesus Christ is teaching us. He wants us to listen and to hear and, and to take those aspects of those lessons into our daily lives. So may it be that we can continue to care and look out for each other in these, uh, in these difficult days, uh, continue to support each other, continue to uh, think and, and pray and do the will of our God while we have the time and opportunity to. So we're going to now close our time together, first of all with a song and then with a closing prayer. So until we meet again, may God bless you, may God keep you, and we'll see each other again soon and very soon.
Gracious Heavenly Father, we come and we are very thankful for the time that you've given us to come and to learn of your Son and the purpose that you have with us through him and the purpose with the whole world. And we are so thankful that we have your word at the moment to give us comfort in difficult times and we have the hope of your kingdom through your Son, Jesus Christ. And we ask that you would continue to be with us all and to watch over us and guard us and bless us and bring the return of Jesus to the earth. That day when your son will come and he'll get rid of all of these uh, difficulties that we face and we will be one with him and we'll be with you, Father, in your kingdom. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 